So Dr. Richard Swinburne, uh, thank you for joining me today on uh, Capturing Christianity. So why don't we start by uh, allowing you to sort of give an overview of your career as a philosopher, as a Christian philosopher, uh, some of the important works that you've written uh, and that kind of thing. So uh, Yes, well, my career has been a long one. I am now 83 years old. Uh, uh, I started uh, my philosophy as an undergraduate at Oxford University back in the 1950s. Um, and I, in, in your American terminology, would be said to have majored in philosophy. Um, but, and I then went on to a two-year graduate degree called the B. Phil in philosophy, which was all it was necessary to have in those days in order to teach in a university. I don't have a an earned doctorate in any way, it wasn't necessary. Um, and then uh, I went, I was lucky enough to have two uh, research posts at that stage. Um, and I was very conscious of the fact that uh, the sort of philosophy I was learning about seemed to be totally insensitive to, to modern science. For example, people discuss free will uh, or, um, without taking into account, well, maybe the universe wasn't deterministic and didn't quantum theory show anything. And um, uh, quite independent of religious considerations, philosophy was not uh, sensitive to modern science. And in particular, I was uh, concerned that I was going on in philosophy because I believed that although it had its deficiencies, the, the then current philosophy, uh, the method of careful and rigorous argument was crucial for uh, Christian theology, and I thought um, philosophical techniques could help um, make Christianity acceptable. Uh, so I, for that reason, was going on into philosophy to learn some more philosophy, and it seemed to me in particular that Christians were proclaiming their views without taking serious attention to what uh, philosophy and science was saying in detail, though Thomas, about quantum theory on the small scale and also about the large scale nature of the universe. And um, so I was saying, I had a couple of research fellowships, um, one for three years, another one for two years, and um, I used these to try and understand science. I've not learned any much at school. And um, uh, also, the, really, the history of science, why uh, people had adopted this theory and rejected that theory. Uh, because once I had understood that, um, I could go on to what I thought was the case. That is to say that you could establish the existence of God by just the same method, by just the same criteria as scientists use to establish their theories. But I wanted to be clear about what the criteria were that's for which scientists uh, uh, propose their theories. So the, after a couple of research fellowships, I got my first philosophy job uh, as a lecturer in your terminology, an assistant professor and an associate professor at the University of Hull. And all my teaching and um, all my writing wasn't on the philosophy of religion at all. It was on the philosophy of science. And um, uh, I did wrote two large and, to some extent, influential books. Um, one on space and time, which was much concerned with what relativity theory had to say about the nature of space and nature of time. and. Then my book on confirmation theory. Um, confirmation theory is an analysis of the criteria by which certain evidence of different kinds makes theories of different kinds probable to different degrees. And um, I showed how the probability calculus could be used for that purpose. And this was a general book, wasn't particularly concerned with religion or even with science. I think the same criteria operate when detectives uh, go to work for establishing which is the most probable uh, um, person to have committed the murder. Um, and but uh, so I taught at uh, Hull for 10 years, something like that. Um, 
including at that stage my first period in the States. I taught for a year as a visitor at um, the University of Maryland then. And um, then I moved on to being a professor at the University of Kiel and I started to write about philosophy of religion and um, I wrote uh, three books by which I have become quite well known on theism, the doctrine there's a God, uh, um, on the evidence for it and on the relevance of such arguments and these were called the coherence of theism, uh, the existence of God and faith and reason. And uh, all books which have had, especially the existence of God, quite an influence, that's true. Um, they're all books which I have, since I've been around many years, I've, I've written, uh, totally rewritten and second editions of them uh, in the la within the last few years. Um, let me say with the same general approach, but uh, um, uh, bring them up to date, uh, refining them in various ways. Um, and uh, uh, the main, main themes of this book, the, the coherence of theism, is about what it means to say there is a God. God is supposed to be omnipotent, omniscient, everlasting, and so on. But I was concerned to spell out what it is to be omnipotent, what we're saying about God when we say he's omnipotent, which literally means can do everything. But nobody really could really can understand it that way because obviously uh, God can't make me exist and not exist at the same time. So one has to be like, start spelling out what it is to be omnipotent. And um, likewise, for being omniscient, for being eternal, and so on. And um, that was, uh, the book was called The Coherence of Theism because it was concerned to show that theism is an internally coherent view. It doesn't entail contradictions. There aren't any contradictions between supposing God to be omniscient in a certain sense and also uh, to be free, for example. Um, and then the existence of God claimed that uh, um, there was good evidence for the truth of that. Um, for the existence of God, it was, uh, uh, I argued, from the most general features of the universe, that there is a universe that is governed by simple and intelligible laws of nature, um, that these laws are such as to lead to the evolution of us, and that we are conscious beings, and I argued that the simplest and most, therefore most probably true uh, account of this is that provided by traditional theism. And then, uh, in answer to the question, so what? Um, faith, faith and reason it, uh, shows that um, <laughs> it uh, will affect your, rightly affect your conduct, um, what you believe about things, and it is rational to be guided by views which are not certain but are probably true in, in, in order to uh, attain great goals and particularly the great goal the Christian religion offers of life here and hereafter in interaction with God. So uh, where have we got to? We got to somewhere around the year 19, um, uh, 1980 and uh, after that, I began to write on uh, more particular matters, um, all of them related to Christian doctrine, uh, although some of them are much more general philosophical interest. And uh, I wrote a book called The Evolution of the Soul, which is about the relation between mind and body. And I hold that uh, we, we are each of us. Uh, a, uh, a combination of a body and a separate soul and that they are in interaction with each other and so when we die the body may decay but the soul is there to be reunited with another body. Um, I moved about that stage from um, uh, Peel to be a professor at Oxford um, uh, my chair is called the Professorship of the Philosophy of the Christian Religion, 
and that le led to me writing four books on particular Christian doctrines. Um, responsibility and Atonement is about, its title implies, our responsibility for our actions and how the uh, death, uh, the life and death of Christ can provide an atonement for them. Um, and then there was Revelation, about what would constitute a divine revelation and how we can recognize one. Um, and then there was the Christian God about the traditional Christian doctrines of the Trinity and the Incarnation, and then a, a book devoted solely to the problem of evil, why God would allow certain uh, evils, in particular sin and suffering, to occur. And um, they formed a tetralogy, really, on Christian doctrine, and um, a separate book, um, although it wasn't technically part of the tetralogy, but it was the most down-to-earth book as regards Christian doctrine, which I've read, written, was uh, The Resurrection of God Incarnate. And I argued there that um, in order to assess any big historic, uh, any historical claim of any deep significance, one has to take into account not merely the particular evidence of what happened at the time, but more general theories of how likely that was to have occurred. And, um, I mean, if, for example, you are uh, a physicist and you look through your telescope and you see uh, a lot of specks in the sky um, uh, moving outwards from a central point, you might think that this is a, a, a supernova explosion. Uh, but if you have a physical theory which says they can't have supernova explosions, then uh, you could only recognize it as a supernova explosion if you could change your whole physical theory. Conversely, if you have a physical theory which says supernova explosions are likely to hold, happen very often, then you don't need too much um, detailed historical evidence to suppose that one had occurred on any particular occasion. So likewise, with the resurrection of Christ, um, it matters very much whether you th think you've got good evidence for a God who might intervene in history. Um, if you have, you don't need too much uh, historical evidence to suppose that it happened on a particular occasion. But if you have good reason to believe there's no God, or that if there's a God, he's not likely to intervene. You need an awful lot of historical evidence to suppose that Jesus is risen from the dead. And with that background, I then argued that um, we do have, well, I was assuming the uh, arguments from the existence of God, we do have good reason to believe there's a God. And I argued that in virtue of his perfect goodness, he would want to uh, become incarnate and uh, if he makes us suffer for a good cause, to identify with us by suffering with us. And with that background, I then argued, more detailed historically, that Jesus was just the sort of person that if he became incarnate, he would become incarnate as. And then uh, I did argue the traditional arguments for the resurrection from the empty tomb and the appearances of Jesus. But my point is, New Testament scholars have utterly ignored the crucial importance of background evidence for assessing this sort of thing. Uh, so where do we get to from there? Well, I've written a couple of popular books um, uh, explaining these things uh, in simpler and shorter terms. Uh, my little book, the Exist uh, Is There a God, has been very successful. And then there was one uh, on the Christian doctrines called Was Jesus God? Um, after that, I have come back to writing again about mind and body. Um, uh, mind, Brain and Free Will was published in uh, 2012. And uh, my latest uh, work has been a second edition of The Coherence of Theism. Um, I may have left something out or one or two things out, but as you see, I've written quite a lot of books. <laughs> and um, they have been 
largely focused on the existence of God and particular Christian doctrines, so in that sense apologetic, but not all of them have been concerned with particularly Christian matters. Um, I am thinking uh, back to your beginning career and uh, how you got your start sort of looking into science. Is this something that you would recommend to other Christians and other philosophers? Well, um, I recommend it to everybody. I mean, it's part to start with. It's uh, it's what the great achievement, of intellectual achievement of the modern world to understand how, how the world works, and um, uh, but and Christians in particular should, should uh, understand this because it. Um, it's, it's God's handiwork, it's something he's provided for us, and we should uh, uh, recognize and understand that. Um, but of course, in also to uh, uh, commend the Christian view to others, um, it is uh, uh, crucial, always crucial, to start from where those others are, and those others, many of them, tend to believe science has shown there is no God. Uh, God uh, was something people believed in in a pre-scientific era. So in order to deal with this, one needs to know about science and one needs to know both what it's achieved and even more importantly, its criteria for achieving them. Because I think that, as I mentioned earlier, its criteria for achieving them are the criteria of the theory must be such as if it's true, uh, you'd find the evidence. If it's false, you wouldn't find the evidence, and it's a simple theory. Um, all of these make it probably true, and they're the very same criteria which make it probably true that uh, there's a God. So certainly Christians should know something. So a Christian apologist should know something about science, yes. So going back to the... Uh I'm thinking about the um, the relationship between philosophy and theology. How can or what can theology learn from analytic philosophy of religion? Uh, well, it can learn a great deal. Um, uh, firstly, it can learn to do some rigorous argument because it's been a characteristic of modern philosophy in the Anglo-American world, which is often called analytic philosophy. Uh, that it is argues for big metaphysical theories using hard, rigorous argument um, on the basis of scientific and other understanding of the world. And um, uh, theology needs to know that if it, if it is to commend itself to others, otherwise it's just a closed system you believe and isolate from one's general knowledge of the world and nobody uh, should do should think in that way. Should think have separate pockets of thought where they think one way and pocket of thought where they think a different way and not bring them together. Um, and uh, I say, if you commend it to the modern world, there's no avoiding science. Is there and there's no avoiding your question was concerned with. Uh, philosophy of religion. Well, philosophy of religion has tried to do just that, tried to show what are the grounds, whether we need grounds for religious belief, and that these are the crucial questions which theology has to face up to in commending its views. Is there anything that philosophy of religion can learn from theology? On the uh, well, yes, indeed, and some philosophers write about uh, uh, religion without knowing much about uh, theology. Um, Christianity, in particular, is purports to be a revealed religion, a religion which is based on a historical event uh, in which God became human, and a system of doctrine built, um, developed by the church from the, uh, that original uh, incarnation, and um, uh, phil phil people who philosophize about religion ought to know in detail just what that system of doctrine uh, uh, is and how it has been differently in 
interpreted by different groups at different times, of course, but they, they need to understand what it is in, in order to be able to assess its justification and its coherence. So in, in recent years, there's been a surge of interest in apologetics, Christian apologetics. So what about this encourages you and then what about it discourages you? Well, uh, in general, of course, it immensely encourages me. It's what theologians, people who are commending Christianity to the world, and Christianity is an evangelistic religion. It is, uh, uh, it would be not be true to itself unless it tried to sell itself to others. Um, and uh, since, as I say, we have to start from where those others are, apologetics is crucial. Um, so it's very good. I'm all in favor of it. Um, obviously, I disagree with one or two ways that people have done this. Um, I uh, think some arguments that for the existence of God don't work, and some people's <laughs> claims that we don't need them don't work. But uh, these are discussable issues with, within uh, a tradition, and uh, it's a very, I'm very glad indeed that uh, Christians are doing this again. So who's, uh, whose philosophical writings do you most admire? And we can, we can look at it like who's Christian, maybe another Christian, and then maybe another uh, non-Christian. Do, do you mean modern philosophers? Uh, let's, say, uh, let's say any time period. Oh, well, obviously, among Christian uh, philosophers, um, I think the, the medieval, uh, Western medieval scholastic philosophers were the people who were really concerned to do for their time the kind of task that analytic philosophers of religion are concerned to do for our time. That is to say, they argued rigorously, thoroughly, uh, for the cogency or otherwise of Christian doctrines on the basis of the then known knowledge of how the world works. And Aquinas, I have immense reverence for, um, don't all agree with these conclusions, but the, the, the approach is absolutely right. And Dun Scotus, who I think was an even better philosopher and was near, more nearly right, but um, doesn't get to give get the attention that, that Aquinas does in the tradition, but those from the past certainly. Um, but all the great philosophers of the past had great and good and important things to say, which one must take account of. But I think those are the ones that I, uh, whose results I appreciate most. Um, among modern philosophers of religion, uh, the important ones in the uh, analytic tradition are, of course, Alvin Plantinga and, and Robert Adams. I think he's extremely good. Uh, among non-Christian philosophers who have done great work um, in, in modern times, uh, Saul Kripke, and uh, he doesn't do much these days, uh, his his work in the 70s was, was very powerful and important. And um, more recently, David Chalmers' work on the mm. mind-body uh, and uh, on, on the very general questions of alternate metaphysical systems and how you would compare them, I think very highly of. So what tips do you have for... Uh, maybe a beginner apologist or someone who's starting to get an interest in apologetics, Christian philosophy, what, what sort of tips would you give them? Uh, they, must, they must learn a lot of philosophy outside philosophy of religion, okay. and they must learn some science and have some appreciation of modern views about what is morally acceptable. They, they may not agree with it, but they must know why, why people think what they do. Um, and uh, so, um, yes, th that is also, of course, important for doing philosophy of religion itself because you can't discuss uh, what it means to say God is good unless you have some understanding of goodness, and that means doing some philosophical work on ethics. You can't understand whether it's probable there's a God unless you've had done some philosophical work on probability and so on. So uh, both for doing philosophy of religion uh, and also for making contact with those who don't know any, 
it's crucial. And um, if people want jobs in philosophy departments, um, although most philosophy departments, or most philosophers are atheists, most philosophy departments these days are happy to have somebody teaching a course on the philosophy of religion, but they're rather reluctant to have someone who is only able to do that. And so if people want a job, they need to be able to teach other areas of philosophy. So I'm, I'm coming at this, uh, this whole thing as an outsider, almost, because I, was, I didn't grow up interested in philosophy or apologetics or, or anything like that. I came, uh, my introduction into apologetics was actually through my brother becoming an atheist. And, uh, and through that uh, part of my life, I realized as I was on this journey looking into the evidence for God's existence, I discovered that there is this whole range of arguments for God's existence. And so I wanted to ask you what your favorite argument for God is. Uh, well, I think the arguments are cumulative, as of course they are for any scientific or historical theory. Uh, just to take historical theory, um, if, if somebody is on a charge of murder in the courts, the courts just don't produce one piece of evidence to suppose that he did it, e.g. that he was at the, t at the scene of the murder at the time. They produce many pieces of evidence which together make it probable that uh, uh, that person committed the murder. Likewise, with the uh, arguments of the existence of God, um, most of them uh, start from some particular recognizable feature of experience of a general kind which the atheist can recognize too. For example, the cosmological argument starts from there is a physical universe. The um, argument from designs, there are various versions of it, but one version starts from there are things behave in a regular way. In other words, there are laws of nature. And then uh, 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 another variant of it starts from um, these laws are such as to uh, produce human beings. And so we go on. There are various features, very general ones, and at the other end of the spectrum, very particular ones people's own detailed religious experiences, and all of these um, increase the probability that there is a God. So I think one shouldn't isolate them from each other. They, they add up. There are one or two arguments which don't fit into this pattern. The ontological argument claims you can show there's a God without appealing to any evidence. So I just don't think it works, and it must be discarded. Okay. Um. Which uh, so earlier on in the interview you mentioned that uh, you mentioned a number of books that you've written. So which of these books uh, would you say that you're most proud of? <laughs> uh, well, the existence of God has been the most influential, and I think it did help in a serious way to bring back natural theology in, into the Christian tradition. So I think that must be the answer. Yes. Okay. Um, and so this is a, a, a question that I'm, I'm really interested in your answer to. Uh, so which philosophical view that you've defended are you least certain of? Yes, I knew that was on your list. <laughs> well, I've written about the problem of evil. Everybody, has, every philosopher has to write about that. Why does a perfectly good God allow lots of people to suffer a lot? Um, and I have developed a theodicy, that is, a, an explanation of why God would allow this. And on the whole, I think my theodicy is correct. But um, uh, there is a lot of suffering in the world, and uh, although it seems to deal with most cases of it, my theodicy seems to deal with most cases of it, what I regard as a fairly satisfactory and obvious way, uh, I th do worry whether it deals with all cases of it. I think it does. But uh, since you asked me, which I am least certain about, it is that. And um, I think there would be something morally wrong with anybody who uh, didn't worry about the problem of evil, uh, even though I think there would be something philosophically wrong if they concluded that it was a... Uh, overwhelming objection to the existence of God. 
And so maybe maybe it's it's a good idea to to uh, also ask the uh, the flip side of the question. So what's your uh, the philosophical view you've defended that you're most certain of? I'm an absolute certain of substance dualism. Okay. <laughs> there are two parts. What, what if uh, what if I think we have some time? So why don't we uh, look at one of those arguments? What's your what's your like strongest argument for a uh, a view that we have this kind of or us as humans we have these two different kind of components? We have a physical component and then a well, I have many arguments, but uh, let's take one from uh, from modern science. Uh, modern science. Uh, <laughs> um, first is that uh, severed nerves can be uh, reconnected, not merely peripheral nerves in the hand and so on, but uh, the spinal cord nerves, and eventually uh, in the same pattern. Uh, brain nerves so that bits of the brain can be replaced by other bits of the brain uh, taken from elsewhere. And um, the second discovery was that um, while everybody knew that uh, thoughts and feelings depend on the cerebral cortex, uh, the top part of the brain, and um, there are two, two halves. There's a left cerebral cortex and a right cerebral cortex. And the discovery was that um, the resulting person uh, has uh, just the same thoughts and feelings and so on, whichever of these cortexes you remove. So, uh, consider the following operation, which could be done one day, it won't be done next year, but it will be done one day. Um, somebody gets hold of me and takes out uh, all of the cerebral cortex, and gets hold of two unfortunates, uh, other people, and takes out their cerebral cortex, and puts my left cerebral cortex into one of these people, and my right cerebral cortex into another. Then both of these people will uh, have enough to make consciousness. They'll both have bottom part of the brain and a, and a cortex. And uh, after all this, they will wake up. And since each of them has the cortex on which my thoughts and feelings depend, they will both claim to be me, they will both live my life, <laughs> they will both behave like me, and so on. Um, so which is me? And uh, there's absolutely no way in which you could tell this, because uh, they've both got parts of my brain, and they both uh, behave like me, got my sorts of thoughts. But one of them must be me, or rather, uh, there are three possibilities. The left-hand one's me, and the right-hand is one isn't, or conversely, or neither of them are. They can't both be, because <laughs> um, neither of them know what's happening to the other. Um, so, um, well, it's, have I survived the operation? Well, it's certainly possible I have, and possible I haven't. But um, there would be no way of telling this. And you couldn't tell, you couldn't identify me uh, uh, on the basis of my physical nature, uh, the phys um, because it will be similar in both cases. Um, you couldn't identify me on the basis of my thoughts and feelings. Um, there must be something else that makes me me, and that's the soul. Now you can see that more precisely if you just take one of these people. Um, this person. It's compatible with everything about this person uh, that it's me, because um, it's got the crucial part of my brain and uh, got uh, and can claims to have been me and so on. On the other hand, it's also compatible with everything that it isn't me. And the other one is, or neither are. So there can only be a truth that it is me or that it isn't me if it doesn't depend on which thoughts and feelings the resulting person has, and it doesn't depend entirely on which part of the brain they have. Uh, so there wouldn't be a truth about which person had survived the operation unless being me consists in something else, and something else can't be the properties, the thoughts and feelings and so on, and it can't be the brain, because we know all that and still, still can't answer the question. So it must be something immaterial that we can't see that makes me me. And if that one's me, the immaterial thing goes that way. And if that one's me, then. But we don't know, we couldn't say. And that means 
there can only be, more generally, there can only be truths about whether a future person is me if being me doesn't consist in the physical. So um, here, here's another... Do you follow that? Yeah, so uh, yeah, there, you have these, uh, these different options and you can't basically, you, if you take this person out or if you take their cerebral cortex out and you put it in two different people, um, I get the, the sort of, I guess you'd call it a trichotomy between these three different options and you can't, yeah. you can't yeah. pick the, uh, well, it seems, that, yeah, it, it does sort of present a sort of uh, puzzle there. And so for, for me, I'm, I, I approach that question as an agnostic, so I'm not sure uh, where I fall on it. I wouldn't, uh, I guess, hearing it for the first time from you, I'm not sure how I would respond to it. Yeah. Um, Let me just put it uh, uh, very quickly, a slightly different argument. If all there was um, to being the person you are is that body with brain and having certain thoughts and feelings attached to it, and all there was to this person being this person is having this body and certain feeling attached to me, then there wouldn't be any difference between you having that body and my, me having this body and conversely, me having that body and you having this body, because in both cases, the physical matter would be the same and the thoughts and feelings associated with would be the same. But of course, there is a difference. There's a vast difference. And again, there must be something else that makes the difference. Okay, walk me through that one more time. So how does, how does that argument look well, like one more time? Well, the, the opposition, the physicalist says, um, we are physical things. Right. Right. Uh, they all, if they are a fairly liberal-minded physicalist, they will say, well, yes, associated with this body are, are not merely events in the brain, but thoughts and feelings, beliefs and desires, a mental life. But the mental life is a property of the body on that view, okay. um, not a property of the self. Okay, well, if that is all there is, just the physical matter and the physical properties and mental properties associated with it, then there wouldn't be any difference between you, on the one hand, you having this body and me having this body, which is the case, and an alternative, me having that body and you having this body, which isn't the case, because in both cases it would be the same body associated with the same properties. Okay. So I, I guess I'm still there's a, there's a still a disconnect for me. I'm not sure how we're able to to switch uh, positions here because for for me I'm thinking like I have these physical things going on in my brain, right? And then these mental properties are associated with those physical events or yeah. neurons firing and all that kind of stuff. How are we getting this? How are we able? You're, to you're not able to do it. But okay. my point is there is a difference. The world could have been made differently. Okay. Uh, I mean, think of yourself as it were. Think of you uh, in a past life being told, being given a snapshot of the future life, and you are being told, look, um, this is going to happen in the future. There's going to be this guy identified by his body, and he's going to have these thoughts and feelings. There's going to be this body identified, and he's going to have those thoughts and feelings. Um, but you would say, yes, but in the past, past life you would say yes, but which is going to be me? And that would be a further part, other than knowing that there was a guy here who was going to have thoughts and feelings and a guy here who was going to have thoughts and feelings. Okay, I see, I see. Yeah, that's another, uh, that's another interesting argument. Let's turn to this. So this is uh, something, something that really interests me. Um, and again, I approach this as a layman. I'm a photographer, right? I'm not a philosopher. But one area of interest for me is uh, epistemology. So one question that, uh, that really interests me is whether or not belief in God can be rational apart from argumentation. So what's, what's your stance on oh, that? Oh, yes, entirely so. Um, it's always, in my view, always rational to believe that things are the way they seem to be in the absence of counter-evidence. Uh, there's a number of words for this principle. I call it the principle of credulity. That is to say, the rational person is the credulous person, the person who believes everything in the absence of counter-evidence. Um, so, 
I mean, your right to believe that you're sitting in a chair interviewing me. You don't need an argument for that. It's so obvious. Um, and like, but of course, it is. somebody can uh, <laughs> wake you up and show you you're only having a dream, that would show you were mistaken. So the principle is always in the absence of counter-evidence. It's rational to believe things are what see. So, person's brought up in a closed religious community and, and has a deep religious experience. It's obvious to him there's a God. He's right to believe it. Fair enough. But uh, he may come out into the outside world and be presented with counter-arguments, and then he may need to consider them if uh, his religious experience isn't very strong and these arguments seem appealing. Um, likewise, it's, it's rational to believe there's a God if, if uh, <laughs> the wisest person in your community tells you there's a God and there's no other person to tell you there's a God because it's always rational to believe what people tell you in the absence of counter-evidence. This is another basic epistemological principle, principle of testimony. Uh, so, yes, sure, but in the modern world we are exposed to a lot of counter-arguments, and um, many people don't have deep religious experiences, and whatever testimony they get from others, it's, it's a, a varied kind. In the modern world, most people, I think, need arguments. Less people needed arguments in the Middle Ages in closed communities. Um, but a similar situation existed in, in the 4th century AD, just after Christianity had been legalized in the Roman Empire. There were innumerable different philosophical and religious positions around, and uh, people needed an argument to, to believe well of them. So uh, I don't are you, So when you say uh, they needed an argument, are you saying like psychologically that was a need for them, or um, is that like a? No, rationally, problem? rationally they need an argument because uh, if we're talking about the fourth century, um, many of them didn't have, as with us, many didn't have relig deep religious experiences. They couldn't rely on the testimony of experts because the experts were <laughs> had different views. Uh, so they've got to sort it out for themselves, and sorting out for themselves means assessing the arguments. So uh, why don't we go ahead and wrap this interview up with yep. this one last question that I have for you. And it was a question that was put to uh, Bertrand Russell, and it goes something like this. So suppose that we could take this interview and put it in a time capsule and show it to a generation in a thousand years. What should you want to tell this generation about the life that you've lived and who you are? Well, I, I don't know, because I would want to know what had happened in the meantime. <laughs> um, uh, uh, I'd need to bring them up to date, and what up to date would consist in would be a matter of what had happened in the meantime. So I would not certainly I can give a general answer to that, but um, I think I would tell them that uh, I have tried to give a, a natural theology, argument from the various characteristics of the universe to the existence of God. And I would also point out that, that uh, the sort of natural theology I provided was largely independent of the state of science at this particular time, because I appeal to <laughs> the existence of the universe. That'll be the case then. I appeal to there being simple, intelligible laws of nature. That'll be the case then. They may, be, they may believe in different laws of nature than ours, but they'll certainly believe in laws of nature. They wouldn't be there unless they were laws of nature. And uh, so I, I think I could point out to them that most of the data from which I am building my theory are data which, although they would put this in different words, would, they would recognize. All right, well, thank you, Dr. Richard Swinburne, for coming on to uh, Caption Christianity. And uh, maybe uh, we'll see you again sometime, so.